Uh, in this uh, particular module and lecture, I am going to talk to you mostly about uh, magnetic materials and uh, uh, being the uh, first lecture in this uh, series on magnetic materials, I am going to consciously confine myself only to discussing uh, the basic principles involved in uh, magnetism. I am not going to draw any particular example as we have done in other uh, cases. So, in the next uh, few lectures, we will go into some of the special cases and find out how the magnetic properties evolve in materials both in bulk and thin films and in nanostructures. So, in today's talk mostly I would like to confine with some basic definitions and uh, some understanding that is needed to, uh, to view different class of uh, magnetic materials. So, uh, I just want you to uh, confine only to some of the basic definitions of magnetism uh, and uh, let us see in the next few uh, lectures how we can go about defining a various class of magnetic materials. So, <coughs> in this uh, uh, talk I will try to tell you the importance of uh, the magnetic structure in a molecule uh, in a material. As you would see here these are all very good uh, uh, cartoons of different materials how they respond and give phase contrast when it is uh, a, a, a under the influence of a magnetic field. Uh, as you can see here the, the cartoon here on the uh, on the right hand bottom is actually a classic example of bubble memory uh, material where you can see all the stripes of this magnetic uh, bubbles or magnetic stripes very clearly defined and they present a domain picture. Similarly, uh, on the right hand side top you can see um, the different uh, range of uh, magnetic uh, stripes that are present those in blue denotes a different magnetic environment those in uh, orange uh, they show a different magnetic environment. Similarly, in thin films you can see the phase contrast between a ferromagnetic and a anti ferromagnetic stripe and because of this phase contrast we can try to understand what is the, uh, <coughs> uh, the level of interaction or how the uh, nano uh, magnetic domains uh, evolve in different uh, structures and here again you can see uh, how the magnetic ferromagnetic domains are distributed in a given magnetic material. So, before we understand how this uh, intrinsic uh, property develops in a material uh, we will look at some basic definitions. I should also say that it is very difficult to singularly isolate magnetism and discuss only magnetic property without discussing a correlated property. As a result magnetism and electricity is one which goes hand in hand. When you think about electrical property you also look into the magnetic property because it is basically the charge and the spin of electron that we are looking at. Therefore, when you look at magnetic property sometimes the uh, importance of that study may have to do with the electrical property of those materials. Therefore, uh, <coughs> uh, when we think about uh, the importance of magnetic material again uh, the example of giant magneto resistance comes uh, vividly to our memory and here is the classical example of how magnetic uh, information can help us order the electrical property in nanostructures and uh, this is uh, uh, a topic which I will be dealing in detail in module 5 uh, under electrical properties of materials and uh, this is one of the most fascinating uh, magnetic nanostructure which has affected today our hard drive and whatever we handle our gadgets in terms of pen drive or uh, iPod all this has to do with the uh, discovery of giant magneto resistance where you are talking about simple arrangement of three layers only nano layers and these are all of the order of 3 to 5 nanometer in thickness and how these um, 
ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic or non-magnetic layers are arranged and depending on the arrangement either in a parallel fashion or in an anti-parallel fashion the whole idea of a hard disk drive or in other words the read head can be engineered. So, in today's uh, life uh, as of now in 20th century we are handling this uh, spin valve nanostructures which has nothing but to do with alignment of this mag uh, magnetic nanostructures either in a ferromagnetic fashion or in a non uh, anti ferromagnetic fashion. So, um, when we study this uh, magnetic property we should understand this globally affects almost every spectrum of application in today's life. <coughs> Um, mother nature has also gifted us with a uh, lot of magnetic materials which are uh, available, but some of these materials as such have proven to be a uh, uh, great help in practical applications. For example, um, we have just uh, come out of the age of using audio tapes, we are now more into uh, other recording medias like iPod and other things where digitally we record we no more record using tapes, but uh, till 1990 audio tapes were very famous and the gamma ferrite which is one form of iron oxide has been used as the uh, tape material which is a ferromagnetic material. And uh, again uh, in today's uh, nano biological applications we have magnetite that is Fe 3 O 4 which is being used it is a ferromagnetic material having TC force 75 to 485. Um, then we can also look at uh, other examples of um, <coughs> different phases of iron ox uh, hydroxide uh, which are also showing interesting properties. For example, alpha FeOOH actually is a AFM anti ferromagnetic uh, material, but uh, the other phase is a ferromagnetic compound with a TC of 180. So, you can see uh, a range of uh, oxides and uh, apart from these oxides we also have our traditional ferromagnetic elements like iron, cobalt and nickel showing strong ferromagnetism and uh, ferromagnetism is above room temperature. So, these are all some of the classic examples of naturally occurring mineral oxides. Um, and uh, metals and alloys which are intrinsically magnetic and having this as the base thousands of materials have been prepared uh, with similar stoichiometry. Now, uh, let us look at magnetic materials uh, as an empirical approach and try to see how we can distinguish one from the other. Then we can categorize what sort of a magnetic material we can talk about uh, <coughs> and uh, depending on the um, the nature of uh, magnetism we can also group them uh, for different applications. Uh, first of all uh, some, uh, some of the terminologies that we use very frequently in magnetic materials is magnetization M. Material with a net magnetic moment is magnetized and the magnetization is the magnetic moment per unit volume within the material. So, that gives the strength of your magnetization M and that depends on uh, the net uh, magnetic moment in a given area and also it depends individually on the size of magnetization and the, <coughs> the number of uh, such dipoles. So, uh, magnetization that way depends on the number density of the magnetic dipole moments within the material. So, if it is more crowded then we are talking about more density therefore, more magnetization. So, we also talk about the magnitude of the magnetic dipole not just on the uh, density as we saw, but also on the uh, magnitude of the magnetic dipole because sometimes they can uh, as we would see in the uh, next few slides sometimes they may be reverse and in one case it, the magnitude of the dipole may be smaller, but it will still result in a net magnetization. And uh, then the alignment of this uh, magnetic dipoles will also cause the net magnetization. Therefore, we talk about arrangement uh, apart from the magnitude and the density. Uh, so, the arrangement of the magnetic dipoles will tell whether there will be a net resultant 
uh, magnetization or not. Um, magnetization in materials generally can be categorized to two things one is unpaired electron spins or it could be due to orbital motion of electrons within the material to a lesser extent. But, so, uh, what is predominant is the uh, number of uh, unpaired electrons, but we should also understand there is a spin orbital uh, contribution spin orbit coupling and uh, because of the orbital motion of electrons also there is a intrinsic uh, moment that is induced, but this is of a lesser extent. So, uh, two contributions from the material itself apart from the dipoles. Uh, so, uh, how do we measure uh, the strength of a material? Now, we need to have external force by which we can gauge whether the material is good or not. So, uh, in general we can general uh, we can generate a, a magnetic field and this magnetic field actually is generated by a solenoid and solenoid is nothing but you um, you wrap up any uh, material say glass or uh, even a ceramic tube you can just wind it with with a conducting coil and then that electric current passing through this conducting coil will give you a flux or a magnetic field and that is how you can uh, generate a uniform flux density within the coil. So, the, the number of turns that you make with this conducting coil will determine what sort of strength that you employ. So, you pass current and this is the length and the number of turns of this conducting wire will give you the strength of the magnetic field. Therefore, you can generally uh, create a, a electrical a, a, a electromagnet based on the number of coils. So, this is not impossible for you to generate in a lab scale. So, flux density uh, actually can uh, be in vacuum uh, within the coil. Uh, so, it increases in proportion to the electric current as we saw and also it increases in proportion to the number of turns per unit length in the coil. So, that would give you the strength of your electromagnet. Now, once you keep a specimen inside the solenoid, then the response of this material to the solenoid will actually determine uh, the magnetization. So, generally the orbital and spin magnetic moments within the atoms respond to the applied mag magnetic field and the flux lines are actually perturbed by the specimen. So, how the flux is uh, uh, either led to pass through the uh, material or it ripples the um, flux uh, determines what set of material you have. For example, if you have a, a material uh, which does not have any uh, magnetic response then you simply see the flux passing through the material and therefore, the flux lines are not perturbed. But if the material has a considerable magnetic moment then it tends to concentrate the uh, flux lines. For example, materials containing high concentration of magnetic atoms like iron and cobalt then you would see that it is actually putting force on the flux lines. Now, there are some materials um, which totally ripple uh, the flux line and this is your flux uh, axis uh, this is the direction in which you apply the flux but you would see totally the flux is rippled and in that case you actually categorize that material as diamagnetic material which will tend to ripple the uh, flux lines. Uh, example water, protein, fat these are all molecules which will not allow magnetic field to easily penetrate through although higher fields can do damage uh, these uh, molecules. Uh, and a classic example of uh, a situation where the material is actually not a diamagnet, but in a superconducting state it behaves like a diamagnet is the high temperature superconductivity and one of the possible application that we would see in detail in the next module is the magnetically levitated uh, train, where the issue of diamagnetism actually brings about a total uh, ripple of this flux lines. Flux density B within material uh, can be determined by both the geometry and the current in solenoid. Magnetic properties of the material and the geometry of the material. So, two three things are interdependent one uh, the solenoid itself will uh, determine what sort of flux density you have then the magnetic property of the material and then the geometry of the material. So, 
B if it is your flux density then you talk about mu u h which is due to your uh, magnetic field and then mu u mu 0 m which is due to the magnetic material itself. Okay. So, uh, two things are uh, uh, interconnected uh, and uh, your mu 0 is nothing but the permeability uh, of uh, free space. So, in case there is no magnetization if the material is not magnetic then your flux density is is equal to mu 0 h, but if the material is magnetic then the other parameter also will come into picture. So, measuring the magnetic moment of the specimen we can actually pass the material through the solenoid and measure the uh, voltage generated across the coil and the voltage is actually proportional to the moment on specimen. So, that is the way we measure the strength of the uh, magnetic uh, moment and we can also use large coil to apply magnetic uh, uh, field to the specimen. We can also try to do this same measurement using either furnace for high temperature applications or a cryostat for low temperature applications and today uh, using this principle many uh, equipments have come into picture. Now, uh, the way the material respond is actually linked uh, to the susceptibility a value which is um, which is actually dependent on both magnetization as well as h. So, we will come to the definition of susceptibility which is usually denoted as chi. Generally magne magnetization changes in magnitude as h is varied. So, this is what you call as a linear response. So, as you increase the uh, field then the magnetization also keeps increasing and the magnitude of the response is measured by uh, chi and uh, therefore, diamagnetic materials will have a very weak negative response because there is no uh, net moment and uh, they have a small negative magnetic susceptibility. So, susceptibility per se can be defined as chi is equal to m by h or sometimes it is defined as a, a difference in magnetization over difference in h. So, this would actually give you um, a chi or sometimes it is also taken from the uh, slope as we uh, as we see from this expression. So, uh, chi can be um, derived from a simple m versus h uh, curve. There is a variety of ways that m responds to this h. So, uh, the response can be uh, based on the type of material that you have or m the chi can actually vary or magnetization can vary with temperature. Response can sometimes uh, depend on the previous history of the magnetic field strength and the directions applied to the material. Uh, in case of thin films it is heavily direction dependent a perpendicular to the film it will show a very different behavior. In, in the axis of the film it will show a very different behavior. Therefore, this angle dependent magnetization is much more uh, exemplified in single crystals and in thin films, but in bulk usually this dependency is not highlighted much. So, uh, in general magnetic materials show a non-linear response if they are really magnetic and suppose your uh, temperature T1 is uh, less than T2 less than three, uh, T3 and T5 for example. So, at high temperatures pr significantly you would see a response like this whereas, at low temperatures you would see a very clear uh, <coughs> magnetic uh, behavior and therefore, uh, they are always non-linear with respect to temperature. So, we can say that M versus H behavior is usually a non-linear behavior and uh, only at small values of H they are usually linear where, where you can see at any point at low values of h they are linear otherwise they are mostly non-linear and m also intrinsically tends to saturate at high fields and at low temperature as you, as you would see here at low temperature that is T1 the saturation is at a much, much lower uh, h whereas, in the case of high temperatures saturation takes a very large field. So, this is one of the, mm, the manifestation of a non-linear response and therefore, if you actually make 
a curve of uh, a plot of 1 over chi as a function of temperature uh, for a low field magnetic susceptibility you would actually see a linear dependence as you would see from this and this is nothing but the Curie weiss law. And uh, if it is a um, ferromagnetic material then this nature of this uh, linearity will change if it is anti ferromagnetic material or diamagnetic material this the nature of this uh, 1 over chi versus temperature plot will actually vary. So, from this we can easily verify what sort of a contribution that we are getting. Typical uh, magnetic material would actually give a hysteresis where two parameters are very interesting uh, to follow one is saturation magnetization it is when you take the virgin sample and then you try to increase the field then it gets saturated and on removal uh, of the field actually it will not take the same path as that of the MS rather it would keep going down where this is your MR that is a remnant magnetization and to completely revert it to 0 magnetic moment then you need a field which is called as HC which uh, in other words called a critical field or coercivity and that coercive field is the strength of how much the magnetic moment uh, is aligned. If it is quickly reversing then you can say that the pairing of these moments are very weak. So, the strength of the magnetic interaction that is going within the sample is actually highlighted based on the nature of the loop. So, just by looking at a magnetic hysteresis it is possible for us to gauge whether it is a strongly correlated uh, spin or very weakly correlated or whether it is paramagnetic or non-magnetic non all this can be verified using a uh, magnetic hysteresis. For example, if a uh, material is uh, a, a strong ferromagnet uh, which has a very uh, good saturation magnetization then the disappearance of this MS against the temperature will decide the Curie temperature. In other words that is the critical ordering uh, of ferromagnetic uh, behavior beyond which the aligned uh, spins uh, will be diluted and it will go into a paramagnetic state. So, if your MS is, dis uh, MS is disappearing as a function of temperature you call that field as a critical temperature for, um, for your Curie temperature. In other words that is the critical ordering uh, of ferromagnetic uh, behavior beyond which the aligned uh, spins uh, will be diluted and it will go into a paramagnetic state. So, if your MS is, dis uh, MS is disappearing as a function of temperature you call that field as a critical temperature for your Curie temperature. So, uh, M depends on the previous state of the magnetization and then remnant magnetization remains when applied field is uh, actually removed. Uh, therefore, we need to apply a field coercive field in opposite direction to reduce m to 0 and that is what we saw from the previous slide. Now, magnetization also uh, can be traced as a function of temperature and if your ma remnant <coughs> magnetization is this at temperature 0 then as a function of temperature you can try to trace what is your remnant magnetization and at the point when your MR is actually going to 0 then you call this as your TC. Heating a magnetic magnetized material generally decreases its magnetization and remnant magnetization is reduced to 0 above Curie temperature. So, this is one of the way you can determine your Curie temperature by plotting MR versus T and heating a sample above its Curie temperature is a way to demagnetize a sample. So, especially for uh, um, uh, for permanent magnets if you heat it beyond the Curie temperature then it completely loses its magnetic property and the only way to again bring it back to a permanent magnetic beha uh, magnet behavior is to again uh, chill the whole sample in a external magnetic field otherwise they remain demagnetized and that is actually uh, called as thermal demagnetization. Now, let us look little bit into the microscopic picture 
of the magnetic materials and see what is intrinsically happening within uh, a material when it has a moment. So, we will uh, look little bit into the experimental evidences and try to make, uh, make some conclusion on the different uh, types of magnetization that comes in materials. One is a paramagnetic gas and a paramagnetic gas is one where it is, uh, it is like a classical gas of molecules each with a magnetic dipole moment. So, uh, in zero field the gas would have uh, almost zero magnetization mainly because these magnetic uh, dipoles are actually very randomly oriented therefore, there is no net resultant spin. So, we can um, we can compare this to a classical gas of molecules and paramagnetic uh, gas usually they will align when an um, applied field is uh, employed and this would tend to orient the dipole moment and therefore, this uh, paramagnetic gas would attain a magnetization. Uh, again as you would see from this cartoon it is not a perfectly aligned system, but there is a net alignment giving uh, some amount of magnetization. Very high fields can actually be used to saturate it, but this is not the real feature of your uh, uh, magnetic material, uh, because typically if it is a magnetic material you should actually see a coercivity, but in a paramagnetic gas you once you remove the magnetic field you would actually see a zero coercivity and that is the sign that uh, th this paramagnetic um, samples cannot be saturated and therefore, it would actually require a very high sa saturation field in order to saturate it. Heating the gas would tend to disorder uh, the moments and hence decrease the magnetization and therefore, the paramagnetic gas um, the interaction energy uh, with the uh, applied field is actually dependent on a term E is equal to minus m b cos theta, where your theta is the angle made between the magnetization of your uh, paramagnetic sample with the applied field axis. So, if you can really overcome this factor then the interaction energy will be maximum. Okay. So, uh, the, the dipole interaction with B actually will determine whether you can uh, get a net uh, magnetic moment and uh, um, the examples of such paramagnetic species are fer ferrous sulphate crystals, ionic solutions of magnetic moments usually they display this paramagnetic uh, behavior. This can uh, the paramagnetism uh, per se can be interpreted based on two models, one is a classical model where you do not really bring in spin spin interaction, where you consider each one as a independent molecule therefore, it is uh, based on uh, the field that you are applying and the cos theta dependence of, uh, of the magnetic moment to the field which will actually bring about the net uh, magnetization or it is based on a Brillouin function which is usually a quantum uh, model where we are considering the spin spin interaction two spins and how they interact the, the coupling between two spins uh, in the presence of the field will give uh, net magnetization. Therefore, the paramagnetism study of paramagnetism itself is a uh, quite a challenge. Therefore, it can be viewed with the two different models and we can evaluate uh, the behavior of a typical paramagnet. Uh, when we come to ferromagnetism, this is purely viewed based on uh, quantum mechanical exchange interaction and materials that retain magnetization even in zero field. So, there should be net polarization uh, of these dipoles um, in and absence of the uh, magnetic field. Therefore, the quantum mechanical exchange interactions favors parallel alignment of moments examples are the uh, magnetic elements like iron cobalt and also nickel. The exchange interaction therefore, depends on the correlation length how uh, closely they are placed and uh, once they are uh, in optimum distance when, when there is a exchange involved then this will result into a 
bigger cluster and therefore, uh, there will be a net magnetic moment. Now, if you try to trace the behavior of uh, this magnetization as a function of temperature, you would see that um, at lower temperatures these moments are aligned uh, parallelly and therefore, there is a strong correlation. Thermal energy in such cases can be used to overcome those exchange interactions and uh, once you keep heating the sample, now these aligned moments can get di uh, disoriented and as a result the magnetic moment can be removed and then we get into a state where you have this T c. Therefore, Curie temperature is a measure of exchange interaction strength and uh, exchange interactions are therefore, much stronger than dipole dipole interactions. Uh, th this is just as a comparison uh, the strength of this uh, exchange interactions are therefore, much stronger and uh, uh, we can actually view this uh, ferromagnetic arrangement in two different ways. One totally as a uh, quantum mechanical uh, system where you only uh, talk about spin spin interaction in the presence of a field. So, all these neighboring spins they do interact and therefore, there is a net moment that is evolved from a uh, unordered state to a ordered state and that is actually coming through the external field. It can also be viewed as a waste field where you do not take into picture the spin spin interaction, you just force whatever be the state of the moment, you just force it using a wise field. A uh, wise field means uh, the external field actually takes care of overcoming all the other barriers. Therefore, you let the uh, external field do the job. So, this is called a wise field. So, uh, there are two ways we can bring about uh, a ordered system from a uh, unordered state. So, the physical in, uh, reason for this quantum mechanical spin spin interaction that has no simple uh, classical analog, but in the mean field approach or the wise approach the ferromagnetism simply we assume that, that a magnetic field uh, can line up the magnetic moments and therefore, it is generally called as orientation polarization where you just use a external field to align the samples. When in um, ferromagnetic compounds when you try to influence the material which is already having a net polarization of magnetic dipoles then you develop into another situation called domains magnetic domains and that is the strength of a ferromagnetic material. So, when you apply a field immediately all the neighboring uh, spins will actually um, in, in one sense percolate together to form a domain and this domain will have a net moment of this order and there can be other moments also, but those are actually aligned in different directions. So, a, a domain picture evolves where not necessarily all the domains have to be oriented in the um, same axis where the magnetic field is applied. So, each domain is magnetized in a different direction, domain structure therefore, minimizes uh, energy due to stray fields. And uh, what happens to uh, such a domain? When you try to increase the field along a particular direction, for example, it is in this direction, then this particular um, domain which was originally in this size will start growing bigger and the other uh, domains will start uh, easing out. In other words, they will coalesce with this bigger domain, so as to form a domain picture like this. So, applying a field changes the domain structure, so you can actually manipulate and how f uh, easily that this domain structure can, can be altered depends on this uh, uh, depends on the strength of the magnetic material. So, domains with magnetization in the direction of the field grow other domains shrink and as a result when you try to overcome this energy then you almost coalesce all the domains together into one single domain. In other words you call this as a single domain behavior where no other domains are there and everything is aligned in the field of its uh, axis of your magnetic field. So, applying very strong moments they, then you can actually revert it into a 
uh, single domain and that is what we see from the uh, typical hysteresis we are talking about this situation somewhere here where all the domains have come into the, this form. And therefore, uh, when we remove the magnetic field then uh, it does not mean that all the domains have to come back to its initial state. It can take a different domain pattern and uh, as a result you will get a net net uh, magnetic hysteresis. Now, we will also see how this domains can rotate and we will make correlation with the nature of the hysteresis loop in the next slide. So, in the previous slide we said as we reverse the field the um, a magnetic hysteresis develops and we also said that the domain does not need to reverse back to its initial state and uh, this is one curve a qualitative measurement picture which will give you an idea about how the domains rotate as a function of field. As you would see here these are the magnetic domains and uh, once you apply initial field there is a uh, there is a area where the, where the slope changes at this point and this is nothing but your pinning point or it is called flux pinning where the magnetic dipoles are reluctant to move with the field as a result a boundary is created here and this wall is reluctant to move. But once you start increasing the magnetic field and strength then you can see that this wall has moved here and as a result a bigger domain has developed and once this pinning is actually overcome then as you increase the uh, field then you can see that a bigger domain can, can emerge out of field. So, once a domain picture evolves then you can keep rotating the domain according to the field direction and that is what you would see here. We have also seen this picture in uh, the earlier slide. And, uh, once this uh, pinning is overcome then the domain actually grows in size and then it would also become a single domain at the saturation. So, this is the way the domains uh, actually form and they dissolve into a one single domain picture. Now, this single domains have a strength and the single domain also have a dimension. It can roughly the single domains have a dimension of 100 nanometers, but suppose you make a particle which is less than the single domain particle uh, less than this domain size then you call that as a single domain. We will look at that situation in one of the ne few next slides and what what would happen when we are trying to rotate this domain two things can happen one this can get frozen over a period of time where the uh, where the domains are actually turning and they would go into a opposite phase. In this case the net moment is in this direction in this case it is in this direction, but along this dimension you see that the dipoles are rotating and this measure is actually called kneel wall or this is called as a anti ferromagnetic block where you have reversal of the spin and this takes this much of energy for the moments to rotate. That's, therefore, this domain wall is called as kneel wall and in some cases you can experience another situation where it is up spin, but it, the domain is actually not rotating, but it is actually minimizing at a point where the moment will get reversed to opposite direction and therefore, that strength where it is neither completely aligned or completely inverted and this measure is called as block wall. Depending on that you can look for different shape of hysteresis and this is one such shape which is a typical hard magnet where you will almost get a rectangular hysteresis loop and uh, this is uh, seen for hard magnets where you have a very large coercivity and very high remanence because this is your saturation and saturation and remanence ratio saturate ms by mr will be almost close to 1 in such case you can call this as a hard magnet 
but in a soft magnet you would usually see that the saturation is somewhere here and your remanence is somewhere here and therefore, your m s by m r is going to be less very less than 1 and in such case you categorize this as soft magnet usually the magnitude of a soft magnet would be of the order of 0.5 m s by m r uh, ratio would be uh, 0.5 therefore, you can uh, find out uh, what set of a domain uh, movement is uh, uh, in, in your uh, material and what is the strength and the coercive force that is involved in such materials. Now, in the ferromagnetic materials you actually come across uh, different cases uh, ferromagnetic uh, material in general can be classified into different uh, states and uh, that depends on the way the domains rotate. For example, uh, this is an animation which uh, unfortunately I am not able to access, but therefore I would just give this uh, link as a uh, reference where you get a very good animation of a rare phenomena in a ferromagnetic material which is called it magnetostriction. Magnetostriction actually comes uh, where your uh, domains actually rotate with your uh, field and as a result what would happen you can see the blue and uh, red uh, dipoles uh, magnetic dipoles they actually rotate in this form and then it will go this way and then it will go this way. So, when it actually goes from this to this you actually have a shrinkage in volume and then expansion of your sample size sample will become larger in this dimension and sample when it actually is orienting the dipoles are orienting this form there is a natural contraction of your sample and therefore, we can say in the presence of a applied magnetic field depending on the field direction and because the magnetic dipoles are rotating there will be a expansion or contraction of your sample size and that is what we call it as magnetostriction which is a phenomena that happens peculiar of a ferromagnet. Uh, suppose the easy magnetization axis uh, easy axis of magnetization other words uh, coincides with the direction of the applied field then you would actually expect a rectangular loop like this. This is the situation when the easy axis of magnetization is overlapping with the direction of your applied field then you would see a uh, rectangular loop of this form. <coughs> In case the E c axis of magnetization is perpendicular to the field axis then you would see a linear loop therefore, in that case the ferromagnetic loop will be more like this and in other words you call this as a hard axis. Okay. You can clearly see that this is the hard axis of magnetization and suppose this is a single crystal one would be intelligent to immediately change the direction of the field. Then from a hard axis you can immediately see such a rectangular axis for a magnetic material. Therefore, the easy axis of magnetization which is uh, intrinsic of your crystal lattice or the way the moments are arranged in your crystallographic plane will determine whether you will get a rectangular loop or a linear loop. So, this is one way that the ferromagnetic compounds evolve and if two adjacent domains magnetize in um, or magnetize in opposite direction and are always separated by a transitive layer which we call it as a block wall in such case you would actually see a block wall movement. For example, in this case you can see the dipole in this direction where there is a blue top and a red bottom uh, dipole fashion and in this case you can see it is a red on the top blue on the Right. So, this is one uh, uh, domain and this is another domain and in between this there is a block wall and in such cases you would see a stepwise shift in the magnetic hysteresis which we call it as a pinning or this is due to the block wall movement. So, this block wall movement can actually go in both directions um, both in the left and the right then this will become very evident that there is a 
block wall. So, in magnetic domain walls you can actually measure the wall thickness where there is a canting of spin. Spin is actually canted from this place to this place therefore, you can even measure this canting where which we call it as uh, domain thickness or wall thickness T and this is typically of the order of 100 nanometer this wall thickness. For a single domain particle actually you do not have domains okay. particles smaller than T this T if the particles are smaller than 100 nanometers generally we say that it is a single domain behavior which we can easily calculate from a given formula. <coughs> now, from an antiferromagnetic situation we can immediately turn down to see what if the neighboring spins are correlated, but they are correlated in opposite direction. In some materials this exchange interactions actually favor a anti parallel alignment and only then the system is stable. So, in such cases you experience a anti ferromagnetic behavior and they will have a very low chi. They will almost resemble that of a diamagnetic material because diamagnetic material shows negative chi, but this will be almost as close to a diamagnet, but uh, with sufficient chi which can which gives an idea that it is a anti ferromagnetic metal. Most of the metal oxides are anti ferromagnetic in nature. Now, we can actually try to overcome this picture of anti ferromagnetism by thermal energy to overcome this exchange interaction. So, what you try to do as you did in the case of uh, ferromagnetism you can try to decouple this exchange interaction using heat or thermal and therefore, you can break down this magnetic order which is called as Neel temperature and this Neel temperature is just the complementary to uh, Curie temperature. So, um, in both cases thermal effects can actually defreeze such exchange uh, correlations and there is another interesting situation where you have a anti ferromagnetism, but this is not a anti ferromagnetism because one of the, these two are uh, exchange coupled, but the magnitude of this dipole is less compared to the magnitude of this dipole. Therefore, there will be a net resultant magnetization as in the case of magnetite or mahemite. So, these are compounds for example, uh, uh, magnetite is your Fe 3 O 4 this is not a ferromagnet per se, but it is a ferrimagnet and uh, different sized moments uh, on each sub lattice is noticed in this sort of ferrimagnets. Now, when we come to uh, single domain particles as I told you if you escape that domain wall thickness then you can call this as a single domain uh, picture and in that case single domain um, magnetization can also introduce a interesting uh, small pa particle magnetism and this is actually understood based on stoner wolfart particle where if it is a ellipsoid type of a particle like this where your magnetization is actually oriented by a factor theta with respect to the E c axis of magnetization, then the magnetic anisotropy energy favors magnetization along certain axis relative to the crystal size. So, this can become a very interesting uh, issue if we can try to understand how this uh, single particle magnetism works. Uh, <coughs> uniaxial uh, uh, the single particles are actually uniaxial single domain particle and uh, uh, the way they make a uh, angle a theta with respect to the E c axis of magnetization gives you a anisotropic uh, energy uh, magno magneto crystalline anisotropy energy and that is actually correlated to sin square theta. Okay. So, uh, where k is actually a constant dependent on the material therefore, your magneto crystalline anisotropy E a is proportional to sin square theta and in that case you would see the sin function will vary as a function of theta and what can happen in such cases the particle can actually get trapped in one of these wells. At low temperature this magnetic moment of the particle can be trapped in one of these wells and therefore, 
this particle moment is actually blocked. So, in order to de-release this one, this blocked particle, then you need to heat it and then it goes into a, a paramagnetic situation. Uh, so, at high temperatures this uh, magnetic moment uh, can be over uh, which is trapped can be overcome and then uh, we can try to unblock uh, this uh, <coughs> uh, this moment using uh, thermal energy and therefore, we come across another interesting situation in uh, in terms of uh, single domain uh, magnetism where we talk something about uh, blocking temperature the magnetic blocking temperature T b is the temperature below which the moment is blocked. Therefore, there is a critical temperature beyond which this uh, blocking can be removed below that the, um, te the moments are nearly frozen which we call it as blocking temperature and this depends on the particle size and to some extent particle shape also. Larger particles have <coughs> higher blocking temperature the longer the observation time the more likely it is that the moment will be absorbed to flip. So, if you increase the your field strength sometimes this uh, blocking can be removed that is the effect of applied field on the single domain particle. So, as you would see here that uh, applying the field uh, along the E c axis favors moment aligned with the field above the blocking temperature this results in mo moment spending more time in the lower well and uh, when you go to still higher temperature then particle exhibits time average magnetization in the direction of field. <coughs> so, this brings you to another situation where this is not exactly paramagnetism, but you come to a state of a super paramagnetism. So, super paramagnetism is not paramagnetic behavior whereas, where it is a magnetic uh, dipole, but it is within the single domain picture and in that it can display some of the paramagnetic features. So, these are termed as super paramagnetic uh, behavior and in the absence of field the moments are aligned in different direction and you can successfully try to uh, rotate this moments close to the axis of your field and therefore, unblocked particles can respond to a field known as super paramagnetism. So, how do the paramagnetic and super paramagnetic particles behave? This is the typical fashion. So, response of a super paramagnet to applied field is actually described by Langevin model. Um, qualitatively, they are similar to paramagnets and at room temperature super paramagnetic materials have much greater magnetic susceptibility than paramagnetic material. So, typically this is a way that we can uh, we can distinguish between a paramagnetic and a super paramagnetic particle as you can see here there is almost no um, saturation whereas, in the super paramagnetic case it may confuse you to be a ferromagnet, but necessarily if you try to open this area then you would see that it lacks coercivity. Therefore, you can call this as a uh, super paramagnetic uh, situation and not a true ferromagnetic signal. So, super paramagnets are often they are ideal for applications where a high magnetic susceptibility is required and zero magnetic remanence is required. So, when you actually take the field off it should immediately go back the moment should go back to zero and therefore, this can be used for many applications and uh, uh, as a result uh, super paramagnets are used in variety of biomedical applications than the typical paramagnets. So, we have sort of uh, <coughs> seen a varied situation depending on how the dipole magnetic dipole orients itself to the applied magnetic field. We have seen the case of uh, uh, paramagnetic gas, we have seen uh, example of how a ferromagnetic cluster will uh, evolve with the domain structure and how antiferromagnets differ from ferromagnets and also we have seen a case of ferrimagnetism and as a special case the super paramagnetic behavior. So, all these are embedded in the so called <laughs> magnetic materials 
and we would see in the next few lectures examples of how to analyze the true magnetic response. Something may give a hysteresis, but it may lack the uh, ferromagnetic order. So, how to distinguish experimentally and what are all the ways we can uh, study the magnetic uh, behavior in uh, materials, especially we will uh, take examples from oxides and thin films and try to look at the various response to magnetic field.